Good afternoon. Assume, assume everyone can hear me okay. Uh, I'm, I'm Alan Levinson, the uh, Schusterman Josie Chair of Jewish History. And on behalf of Professor Yael Lavender Smith and I, I we want to welcome you uh, to this Presidential Dream Course lecture connected to our class, The Artist Bible. Before uh, introducing Professor Ann Jensen Adams, today's speaker, uh, I have a few few thanks and uh, a few comments. Uh, there's, um, since I'm sure to forget this if I don't say it first, there's uh, water and coffee uh, outside set up for everyone to hang around after the talk and um, uh, schmooze, to use the technical art history term. Um, and so uh, I want to thank uh, 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 Trice Hyman, uh, the Schusterman Center's uh, uh, event coordinator, and plus oh, a whole lot more, and uh, for making sure that all of our speakers in this series have all their arrangements made so nicely, and that we uh, are able to reach our Zoom audience, um, who, for whatever reason, don't find, find driving to Norman uh, five o'clock on a work day convenient. I, I can't imagine why that would be the case. Uh, I want to also uh, thank our um, respective uh, 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 leaders, uh, History Department Chair Alyssa Faison and Deans uh, David Robel and Corey Phelps for their support uh, to team teach this course, which has um, been great. I also want to thank uh, the president and the provost's office for their support of this uh, and every presidential dream course over the last 20 years. I think um, those of you who are uh, students and are and relatively new to OU uh, may not realize that you're in the middle of you're in the middle of foot, some football traditions. You know, you know, but you're also in the middle of a lot of great academic traditions, and this is one of them. Uh, so these. Uh, uh, presidential dream courses have gotten great support over the years uh, by, by, from various uh, OU presidents and provosts. I also want to uh, especially thank our, um, really our newfound and wonderful partners at the uh, Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art, um, who uh, really, uh, we were just looking for a good venue to show slides and we found uh, so much more uh, people who are willing to partner with us, do collaborative displays. If you walk into the museum, just to the left, there's a, a series of uh, paintings and etchings connected to this class and um, who hosted Yael and I uh, just last Friday, uh, coffee uh, with the collection. And so Amanda, and uh, Hadley, thank you very much. It's been great working with you. I'm glad. I'm, I'm, I'm really. I'm really glad we're only halfway through the. the uh, you know, not even halfway through the class, and halfway through our speakers, um, because it's been a great pleasure to to work with you. Uh, now that we're all coming out of um, COVID confinement, I need to remind you to turn off your cell phones or silence them, and. Uh, when we do get to the Q and A period, um, I'll grab a microphone to people and, and bring it to them so everybody can hear your question. Let me ask you, please keep um, your questions concise and let Professor Adam Adams do the A's. Uh, so uh, she's the lecturer. Okay. Uh, Ann Jensen Adams is professor of history of art and architecture at the University of California, Santa Barbara, reaching the, researching the history of science portraiture and the role of images in constructing identity. Winner of fellowships from the National Science Foundation, the Ministry of Education and Science in the Netherlands, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Mrs. Giles Whiting Foundation and the J. Paul Getty Trust. Her work on the 17th century includes a historiography of du Dutch portraiture and a monograph of painter Thomas de Keyser. The 17th century Dutch master Rembrandt van Rijn is known for a new type of empathetic portrayal of his contemporaries. This empathy is also evident in his depiction of biblical figures and narratives with a focus upon his depiction of the narrative of Bathsheba and King David Tonight's lecture, this afternoon's lecture, examines the sources of Rembrandt's empathy 
including events in his own life, debates within Dutch Protestantism, and the challenges faced by artist painting for a market made up of patrons of multiple faiths. As our students discovered this morning, and what I had heard through the grapevine is that Professor Adams is also a superlative classroom teacher full of wit and wisdom. So without further ado, please give a warm OU welcome to Professor Ann Jensen Adams. Thank you so very much for that generous introduction. And let me say how pleased and honored I am to be here. Um, I've just found the hospitality unbelievable. And um, I really enjoyed, uh, as I say this, uh, as Alan said this morning's um, work with the students. So I'm happy here to share with you uh, uh, a little bit about Rembrandt's empathy. Let's see, can we have the... There we go, thank you. Rembrandt's painting of Bathsheba at her bath, now located in the Louvre Museum, is one of Rembrandt's best known paintings. Indeed, it is so famous that our consumer culture has used it to promote a wide variety of products. From luxury soap with the advertising text, does ordinary soap leave your bathroom dull? Rembrandt's classic Bathsheba at her bath but arrives fresh from the Louvre Museum to your loofah. Bathsheba soap with, quote, legendary lather is irresistible. You'll want Bathsheba for yourself. Or you may purchase a limited edition sterling silver medal of Bathsheba from the Franklin Mint's Genius of Rembrandt collection for only $125. The 20th century uh, uh, Spanish artist, Pablo Picasso, repeatedly returned to Rembrandt's painting as an inspiration for his nudes. As have anonymous painters producing copies for contemporary living spaces. Here for just $93.99 for a quote, qualifying order using artist grade canvas, and vibrant inks for a real gallery look, all of these adaptations of Rembrandt's painting rely for their value more on Rembrandt's fame and the captivating nude than on the biblical subject herself. My interest this afternoon, however, is in just this. What exactly were the biblical origins of Rembrandt's treatment of his subject? What might Rembrandt's painting have meant to the viewers of his time? And what inspired Rembrandt to create such a captivating work? I show you here a self-portrait created by Rembrandt at about this time, and on the right, Rembrandt's Bathsheba photoshopped onto an easel in a reconstruction of Rembrandt's studio in the house in which he lived and worked and which you can still visit in Amsterdam today. In 1654, Rembrandt put the final touches on this affecting painting that captures a moment in a narrative of which the British evangelist and Bible scholar G. Campbell Morgan once wrote, in the whole of the Old Testament literature, there is no chapter more tragic or full of solemn and searching warning than this. This dramatic biblical narrative engages, among other emotions and events, desire and satisfaction, fidelity and adultery, the death of a husband and the birth of an illegitimate son. To summarize 2 Samuel 11 verses one through 27, which King David of Israel must have wished was never recorded. One evening, King David, famous for earlier killing the giant Goliath, spied from his rooftop a drop dead, gorgeous woman bathing. Upon asking about her, he learned that she was married to Uriah, the Hittite, who was a soldier in his own army. David, of course, should have stopped there. 
but instead he commanded that Bathsheba be brought to him. He slept with her and she conceived a child. David then began to plot how to cover up his act. His first attempt was unsuccessful. He commanded that Bathsheba's husband Uriah return from battle, assuming that Uriah would race home and sleep with his beautiful wife before returning to war. But being a devoted subject of David and concerned for his men, Uriah returned home and instead slept with his fellow soldiers. Foiled, David conceived a second plan. He sent Uriah back to the front with a message to Uriah's commanding general that Uriah be sent to the front lines in the fiercest battle. David's ploy worked. Uriah was killed and the news sent back to David and Bathsheba, now his widow. After mourning the death of her husband, Bathsheba was again summoned by David who took her as his wife and she bore him their son. God, however, was displeased and the son died in its seventh day of life. Rembrandt depicts Bathsheba here, seated on the crumpled sheets covering a bench beside a rich brocade covered bed. The setting suggests a room in King David's palace rather than the humble room of a soldier. A wizened old maid gently cleans and oils Bathsheba's right foot with a cloth. The red fabric covered bench just visible in the lower right might bring to, to mind Uriah's death at the center of the story. Bathsheba herself is life-sized, which serves to engender both an emotional identification with her plight, but subliminally a palpable affective relationship of our body with the image which we view. In these aspects, Bathsheba is markedly different from previous representations of the subjects in two different types of treatments of the theme. The first of these is here represented by the small scale panel by the Flemish artist Henri Metteblesse from the previous century, which stresses the narrative over the figures involved. David, in the upper right, spies on a teeny tiny Bathsheba, nearly invisible in the lower left, her legs dangling in a pool as a messenger hands her the summons from the king. More usual, however, are paintings of the subject that depict Bathsheba as the beautiful and idealized young seductress scantily draped in rich silk or gauze that only emphasizes her voluptuous, otherwise nude body. In this painting by Jan Masais, also from the previous century, a male messenger points to King David spying on her from his palace balcony in the upper left as the messenger relates his master's command. Rather than conveying a tragic narrative, Bathsheba has been reduced to a titillating pinup for the pleasure of her primarily male viewers. While shifting the responsibility for David's desire for, from him to her seductive body. The youthful beauty of Bathsheba's two attendants in the lower right are an added bonus. This latter tradition continued into Rembrandt's time in paintings such as that on the left by Rembrandt's own pupil, Willem Drost, who, unlike Rembrandt's figure, seductively gazes at us, her viewers, with heavily lidded bedroom eyes. One element in both paintings add a note of mystery. Both depict Bathsheba holding a letter. Nothing in either the biblical narrative or these paintings indicates from whom it was sent or its contexts. I return to this letter at the end of my lecture. Rembrandt's Bathsheba is gently highlighted against a dark background, which echoes and emphasizes what must be the somber thoughts passing through her mind. 
while striking, she is also an ordinary, unidealized woman with slightly saggy skin. Her nude body adorned only with a jeweled armband, a single gem on a necklace, pearl earrings, and a beaded hairband, apparently gifts from the king. A whisk of, of gauze just covers her sex, emphasizing the central element of her narrative. The most notable aspect of the painting for us at the moment, however, is Bathsheba's averted face. Oblivious to the viewer, with unfocused eyes and lost in thought, she's apparently musing over the message contained in the letter in her right hand. Rembrandt's Bathsheba is anything but an objectified woman to be gazed upon. Rather, her unidealized body, unfocused eyes, and inward gaze elicit from us, her viewers, an almost painful empathy with her plight. Along with Bathsheba, we share her distress at her impossible dilemma created by others more powerful than herself. Unable to turn down the advances of the king, helpless to stop what amounts to the murder of her husband and grief over his death. This empathetic rendition of his subjects is characteristic of many of Rembrandt's paintings, portraits, history paintings, and my subject today, his biblical subjects. Two more examples, one from early in his life and the other late, reveal his developing thoughts and abilities. The first of these is the story of Susanna and her elders on your right, which I compare with a typical example by Rembrandt's slightly older contemporary, Hendrik Holsius on the left. According to passages in Daniel 13, Susanna, another pious married woman who was spied upon bathing, this time by two men, well-respected church elders. Finding her irresistible, these men attempted to blackmail Susanna into having sex with them by saying that if she did not submit to their desires, they would accuse her of adultery with a young man under a tree in her husband's garden a crime punishable by death. Susanna refused, and they followed through with their false accusation. This story, however, has a happier ending for our young heroine. When interviewed separately by David, the two men were caught naming different kinds of trees under which they claimed her adultery took place and were themselves condemned to death. As with Bathsheba, Rembrandt depicts Susanna as a beautiful, vulnerable, young Dutch woman, as if she were the girl next door being subjected to a horrendous visual violation. And as with Bathsheba, Rembrandt isolates his subjects. Pilate in the center of the image, Susanna cowers from the two spying elders. The face of just one is nearly invisible in the vegetation behind her. I've made the detail here lighter than the painting for clarity. And art historians have sp spilled a lot of ink trying to find the second elder. In this earlier work, he's conveyed a sense of Susanna's vulnerability in her awkward attempt to cover her nudity. But her gentle, startled face beseeching us for help does not yet engender the kind of powerful empathy elicited by Bathsheba some 20 years later. My second example dates from the final year of Rembrandt's life in which Rembrandt has fully mastered his ability to convey a narrative with heartrending power. This is a scene from the New Testament parable of the prodigal son as related in Luke 15, 11 to 32. A man had two sons. Rather than being willing to wait for his inheritance after his father's death, the impatient younger son asked his father for his inheritance immediately. 
Upon receiving his portion, this younger son traveled to a distant country and spent it all quickly on gambling, wine, and prostitutes. With nothing left, he was forced to take work as a swineherd, coming to envy the food the pigs themselves were fed. Rembrandt depicts the moment when the destitute younger son gave up and returned home. The father embraces him with forgiveness, covers his tattered garments with a fine robe, and commands that a celebratory meal be laid. The dutiful elder son protests loudly, saying it was he who had been patient and remained home taking care of his aging father. The father famously replied that he has forgiven his younger son who is lost and now was found, returning in a sense from the dead. Now, most 17th century artists, such as Gabriel Metsu on the left, depict an earlier episode with titillating scenes of the son's debauched life, enjoying the fruits of his inheritance. Rembrandt, in contrast, meditates on the son's return, empathetically fo focusing on the father's embrace, while the younger son's face is buried in his father's cloak. Rembrandt skillfully conveys his father's complex emotions, awareness of his son's debauchery and sin as forgiveness spreads across his eyes and brow. In order to more fully understand Rembrandt's very personal treatment of these biblical subjects, I'd like to step back and now share with you the larger context in which these remarkable paintings were created, beginning with the multicultural society in which they were painted, turning then to focus upon individual experience as practiced by its Protestant population, and closing with the relation of Rembrandt's art to the dramatic events of his later life. Located in Northern Europe, the Netherlands is a country less than one fourth the size of Oklahoma. Amsterdam, the city in which Rembrandt created these works had, in Rembrandt's early years, a population about 130,000, roughly the same number of inhabitants as Norman. After declaring its independence from Spain at the end of the previous century, and with the founding of the Dutch West and East India Company trading companies whose ships you see in the foreground, Amsterdam was the birthplace of capitalism and well on its way to becoming the economic center of the world. Although a tiny nation itself, its economic might was built upon its expansive world trade. Ships from the Netherlands brought home, among other goods, spices from Asia, coffee from the Middle East, sugar from South America, and slaves from Africa transported into far-flung Dutch colonies for the production of these many goods. After arriving in Amsterdam, the riches brought from around the world were loaded onto barges, which disgorged their wares here in Amsterdam's town square. I show you a 17th century Dutch painting of the square. With the imposing town hall overlooking the square, we see the customs house just to the center right, where goods were assessed and taxed. Some of these goods were then transported onto warehouses for redistribution to the rest of Europe. Many others were traded in the markets in this square. The ships that brought these goods also brought a wide variety of merchants from foreign lands. In the lower left, next to the two Dutch merchants, we see three men from the Middle and Far East. Also on these ships were Africans, ranging from the Congolese ambassador to, the, to Amsterdam on the left, to day laborers see, seen here smoking in a tavern. Many of these latter had originally been taken onto Dutch merchant ships abroad to replace Dutch sailors who had stayed in the colonies or died of disease or scurvy. Recent archival research has revealed 
that a considerable number of these remained in Amsterdam, some even becoming citizens integrated into the fabric of Dutch society. Secondly, at its founding, the reformation of the previous century, the Netherlands had become a predominantly Protestant society, taking over the formerly Catholic churches for their worship. In contrast to the older Catholic faith in which worshipers witnessed a priest conducting mass in Latin and saints interceded with God on behalf of the faithful, Protestants focused upon God's word and a direct relationship with God, while church decoration was considered distracting. With the exception of text boards, all decoration was removed, ceremony was minimized, Ministers conducted services in Dutch rather than Latin, and the faithful were expected to read God's word for themselves. To facilitate this among the general population, the Bible was translated into Dutch. While earlier translations had been made, they were incomplete and inadequate. So in 1637, the States General, equivalent of our Congress, commissioned the first authorized Dutch translation, the title page I show you on the left. Dutch publishers began producing summaries and glosses of its contents, as well as sermons and commentaries in Dutch. While Catholics had meditated on God and his representatives, Protestants focused on their own spiritual journey. Moreover, as practiced in the Netherlands, Protestants did not proselytize. Rather, stressing responsibility of the individual for their own salvation, Protestants were more or less tolerant of other religions. In other words, if a benighted soul went to practice another religion and go to hell, that was their responsibility. This resulted in the Netherlands and Amsterdam in particular becoming a haven and a magnet for those persecuted elsewhere, including the large number of Jewish communities being driven out of Spain and Portugal. In more tolerant Amsterdam, they settled their families and built temples such as the exterior and interior of the earliest of these seen here in two 17th century paintings. These social and religious changes had a significant impact upon Dutch art, <clears throat> including the new, the new popularity of non-religious paintings, landscape, genre paintings, still life and portraiture, and many of the paintings of biblical subjects by other artists relied upon the inherited tradition. And this is the difference between Rembrandt and his many contemporaries. His many contemporaries relied upon previous images from previous centuries, whereas Rembrandt really looked at the world and the Bible anew himself. Now Rembrandt's focus, response to this focus on the individual <clears throat> by the, his Protestant faith, took a very personal turn. From early in his life and continuing to its end, he repeatedly examined his face and particularly his emotions, creating more self-portraits than any other artist before him. I show you here just a small selection of nearly 80 paintings, drawings and prints of his face, which Rembrandt made over the course of his life. It is, of course, not possible to ask Rembrandt what life events led to his profound sense of empathy with his fellow men and women as revealed in his paintings. But I would like to suggest that Rembrandt's empathy was rooted in his experience of his Protestant faith, in his experience of Amsterdam's multicultural society, and in particular, to his experience of a number of dramatic events in his own life. Now, Rembrandt was born in Leiden, about 30 miles southwest of Amsterdam. Leiden was a small university town with an entire population at the time, less than two thirds that of the University of Oklahoma alone. He was the ninth of 10 children whom his mother bore while his father was a moderately successful miller of grain. I show you here a grain mill on the ramparts of Leiden, not a particularly promising start for one of the most remarkable artists of the early modern period. 
Rembrandt did, however, receive an excellent education. From the age of seven, he attended the Leiden Latin School, which gave him the ability to read not only historical texts in the Bible in Dutch, but also more specialized texts in Latin. His school survives here, the steep, steep, uh, step gabled building in the middle left. He then entered Leiden University for a short time, although scholars now think he enrolled basically to avoid having to, uh, to, avoid having to serve in the city's civic guard. After his initial training in painting, at the age of 26, Rembrandt moved to Amsterdam, a city beckoning with promise for a young artist. Here, Rembrandt initially went to live and work with an art dealer, Hendrik van Ellenberg, who lived in a large house at the end of the central street in the artist's quarter. And the street is here in uh, white. Within 10 years, Rembrandt was successful enough to be able to afford an imposing house just around the corner, which you see here, the house to the left with the red shutters and green door, where he set up a studio and began to fill with a collection of paintings. The house, as I mentioned, still stands today as a museum, its interior reconstructed more or less as it was in Rembrandt's life. Now, this was also the street and district in which lived many of the black inhabitants of the city. I show you Rembrandt's residence and the homes of some of the community's most prominent Afro-Dutch members. Not surprisingly, Rembrandt began drawing, etching, and painting his neighbors, including this etching of a young black woman. While this does not yet convey the kind of empathy of Rembrandt's later works, he has attempted to portray her with sympathetic accuracy. Later in life, Rembrandt created this affecting portrayal of two young African men who also were most likely neighbors and free men. Rembrandt is thought to have kept this painting for himself for it has been identified in an entry in a late inventory of his possessions. The youth to the right wears what appears to be an historical costume, possibly suggesting the nobility of his African ancestors. The figure at the left informally rests his chin on his companion's arm as if in friendship and support. We are not important to them as their eyes gaze elsewhere. The figure looking down to our lower right and the other focusing on something, possibly his own thoughts, as he looked beyond the frame to the upper left. It is difficult to determine what they might be feeling, but Rembrandt has empathetically conveyed a sense that they do not feel completely at home in this foreign city. Rembrandt's portrait is vastly different from other images of Africans painted by his contemporaries such as Jurian von Strake's depiction of a young black servant in an expensive silk cloak shot through with gold threads beneath an imaginative deep velvet curtain. Holding a glass of beer, this young man is portrayed as vastly different from Rembrandt's subjects. Rather, he appears to fit comfortably among the costly imports laid out before him, including lemons from Turkey, grapes from the Middle East, porcelain from China, and a silver plate and tall ewer made of silver mined in South, Africa, South America. Rembrandt Street also lay in the district in which lived Amsterdam's growing Jewish community. Temple Nevi Shalom, founded in 1608, and the Beth Israel Synagogue, founded in 1618, were literally down the street. Rembrandt was inspired to draw and etch both contemporary Jewish emigrants as well as imaginative subjects from the Old Testament. As is characteristic of many of Rembrandt's works, he seems to have drawn his subjects from life, but giving them an historical context. The ambiguous setting of this etching does not correspond to the exterior of any synagogue of Amsterdam, and no Amsterdam synagogue had such a large interior before Rembrandt's death. Nonetheless, the figures are sympathetically portrayed in quiet conversation or solitary contemplation. Rembrandt's treatment of his neighbors 
is much more affecting than the objectifying and anthropological treatment of the same community later uh, imagined by the French immigrant Bernard Picard early in the next century. Here Picard focuses upon conveying to us the details of the Jewish holiday of Sukkot, including what Picard termed the festival of Psalms, of Palms. Portraying all of the figures with more or less the same features, Picar is here more concerned with enumerating the details of the ceremony than a sense of individuality or personality of its participants. Also along the streets of Amsterdam, like many European cities, and of course ours today, live the homeless and urban poor. Artists such as Adrian van de Venne on the left caricature Caricature, caricatures these poor as violent and dangerous. Here a man with a peg leg is beating another with his crutch, while a woman yells at him and a dog attempts to restrain him by biting his leg. Early in his career, Rembrandt also began recording them with carefully observed detail. Some of his earliest, such as the beggar on the right, are not depicted with complete empathy, this elderly man leans on a cane, but is actually faking an amputated leg. You will notice the beggar's left calf and foot on our right is bent back and partly hidden under his ragged cloak. One of the many ploys beggars used to elicit empathy <clears throat> uh, from their viewers. But already Rembrandt has conveyed a sense of closely observed individuality at the least recognizing the poor man's humanity. Shortly, however, Rembrandt began to feel considerably, considerable empathy for them. Indeed, Rembrandt's identification with the humanity of his subject soon went so far as depicting himself as a raggedly clothed beggar sitting on a mound, his face readily recognizable from the many self-portrait etchings he was making at the time. Unshaven with the fabric of his shoes separating from their soles to reveal his toes, hunched over from the cold, Rembrandt scowls at us, out at us and past us with his gap toothed mouth open as if crying for our aid. Recalling the personal introspection of his Protestant faith, Rembrandt soon began to depict himself as an actor in a number of his religious paintings and etchings such as Descent from the Cross, where here he portrays himself as the scowling figure clutching Christ's arm as he is removed from the cross. Rembrandt's unruly wiry hair and bulbous nose are immediately recognizable. With his environment, his religion, and these works in mind, I'd now like to return to Rembrandt's Bathsheba and examine this masterpiece in the context of particular events in Rembrandt's life at the time. As I described at the beginning of this lecture, this painting is unusual for Rembrandt's affecting depiction of Bathsheba, isolated and lost in thought. Moreover, notably, the contents of the letter Bathsheba holds and upon which she muses is not at all clear. As I have also described, Rembrandt's portrayal is very different from that depicted by one of his pupils at the time, Willem Drost. Drost portrays Bathsheba in the inherited tradition of a beautiful, seductive young woman presented to we the viewers as an object of sexual desire. This is particularly notable if we compare the faces of the two paintings. Drost's idealized Bathsheba seductively tilts her head as she gazes directly out at us with lowered lids. In contrast, Rembrandt's Bathsheba appears to be based on an actual woman with her head averted and unfocused eyes gazing inward, lost in thought. X-rays of Rembrandt's painting, however, reveals a surprising secret. While much of the painting was unchanged, Rembrandt originally portrayed the head and face of Bathsheba raised, tilted, and looking out at the viewer, much more like that of Drost. Given that Willem Drost was a pupil in Rembrandt's studio at the time, it appears that Drost was not only working in the earlier visual tradition, 
but actually inspired by Rembrandt's original conception. We are compelled to ask then, what might have prompted Rembrandt to make this change in 1654? What occurred in his life that shifted his conception of Bathsheba from an objectified woman to one with whom he subjectively empathized? To answer this question, I'd now like to take a closer look at Rembrandt's personal life. To begin with, we must look back some 20 years to Rembrandt's youth when he fell in love with Saskia van Allenberg, the niece of the art dealer for whom he had been working. Here I show you a delicate silver point drawing on an expensive sheet of parchment that Rembrandt made just three days after their engagement. Saskia is dressed as a shepherdess in a floppy straw hat ringed with flowers and holding a rose, an allusion to the long tradition of pastoral love poetry. Over her shoulders is draped a comaduk, a garment used to protect her clothing as she combs her hair, which means that Rembrandt drew Saskia in the morning. Saskia lovingly gazes at her future husband, the first and primary viewer of this drawing. Beneath her sketchy portrait, Rembrandt has written, this is drawn after my wife when she was 21 years old, the third day after we were engaged, 8 June, 1633. Rembrandt was clearly smitten by his fiancee and portrayed her many times during the nine short years in which they were married. He painted her as Flora, the goddess of flowers in spring, etched her as his, as his beloved companion, and drew her in bed, recover, recovering from one of the four children which she bore. The birth of the last child in 1642 resulted in tragedy as it led to the death of both Rembrandt's beloved Saskia as well as their infant. On the left is a drawing Rembrandt made of Saskia sitting in bed with a child while a nurse sits protectively by the bed, keeping watch on both mother and child. The only infant of the couple to survive childhood was their son, Titus, who was less than one year old when their mother died. Rembrandt hired a wet nurse for Titus, the older widow of a trumpeter from a small town in the countryside, Cherki Dirks, who soon also became Rembrandt's lover, an arrangement that was not uncommon at the time. Five years later, Rembrandt hired as a housekeeper Hendrike Stoffels, a young and beautiful woman also from the countryside. Although Hendrike was 20 years Rembrandt's junior, he soon took her to bed, preferring Hendrike over the older Herke. Here Rembrandt's life becomes complicated and I'm afraid to say unsavory. Insanely jealous, his son's nurse and previous lover, Herke Dirks on the right, sued Rembrandt for breach of promise of marriage which for reasons described below, Rembrandt never would have offered. However, the courts awarded her a maintenance income, which she found unsatisfying. Her jealousy drove her to continue to pursue Rembrandt, whom she then tried to blackmail. In exasperation, Rembrandt had her imprisoned in a woman's workhouse for unstable behavior. Much of this and the subsequent grief of Rembrandt's life was due to the challenging financial arrangements which Rembrandt had originally made with Saskia's family, not unusual for the time. <clears throat> Specifically, upon Saskia's death, Rembrandt would have access to Saskia's inheritance for the support of their son Titus, as well as his, himself, but only if Rembrandt did not remarry. For this reason, Rembrandt never would have promised marriage to Herke Dirks, and was even unwilling for financial reasons to, ma to marry his Hendrike Stoffels, who in 1654, the year in which he painted Bathsheba, bore Rembrandt a daughter whom they named Cornelia. This child born out of wedlock was too much for the Protestant church council. The council summoned Hendrike to appear before them and when she refused to abandon Rembrandt, it then banned her from receiving communion, a terrifying sentence for a devout 17th century woman. Turning again to Rembrandt's depiction of Bathsheba in the same year, scholars have suggested that Rembrandt may have had in mind Hendrike Stoffels as he painted this work and might even have used her as his model. 
While from a 21st century perspective, we may feel it strange that an artist was paid his mistress nearly nude, there was a long tradition of artists painting intimate portraits of their mistresses and wives. Whether or not Hendrika served as Rembrandt's model, the troubles that Hendrika was experiencing with the church at the time most certainly contributed to, to Rembrandt's empathetic rendition of his subject. Specifically, like Hendrika, Bathsheba was condemned to grief due to the love of a man who, I might add, suffered no consequences for their union. As we have seen, renditions by other artists suggested that the blame for Bathsheba's adultery lay squarely with her irresistible body, sparing David any responsibility for his adultery. In contrast, Rembrandt's depiction of Bathsheba places the blame anywhere but with Bathsheba herself. Instead, Rembrandt expresses overwhelming empathy with Bathsheba as she considers her future and fate. But what exactly was Rembrandt depicted her as thinking, apparently stimulated by the contents of the letter which she holds? Only one letter is mentioned in the biblical text, and that's the letter which King David sent with Uriah to the front, certainly not that which Bathsheba holds. All other messages are verbal conveyed by messenger. So why the emphasis on the letter? And what does this mysterious letter do for our understanding of the painting? Now, as I discussed earlier, Protestant stress on individual responsibility for their own salvation, including the importance of an individual being able to read and, con and contemplate messages of the Bible. And the commercial growth of the Netherlands contributed to the need to write as well. As a result, the Netherlands had the highest literacy rate in the all of Europe, with 53% of the population able to read and write. Along with this literacy developed an appreciation for eloquent letters and a fine hand. I show you a, man, a letter writing manual here on the right. And letter writing and reading was a subject of countless genre paintings. Returning to the letter with Beth, which Bathsheba holds, a contemporary note which the 17th century viewer would have appreciated and the contents of which are, so, are the subject of her sober reflection, the painting then focuses to ask who sent this letter what message does it contain? As mentioned above, it's hardly the letter that King David sent with Uriah to the battlefront. The genius of Rembrandt's edition of the letter creates an ambiguity about the sender's identity and the letter's contents, which cause us to linger over the work and without picturing them to contemplate the various aspects of the biblical narrative. It thus expands and activates the painting for us, its viewers, basically condensing the entire narrative into this single image. Perhaps the letter is meant for us to think of the letter which King David sent, uh, sorry, the messenger, which King, the message which King David sent to Bathsheba, commanding her to come to him. Perhaps it's the letter that was sent back to King David and Bathsheba that um, uh, reporting that Uriah had died. And certainly the small smudge of red on the edge of letters suggests that the latter may be the case. I'd like to suggest that with this extensive ambiguity, Rembrandt meant for us, the viewer, to linger over the painting and pass our thoughts over the entire narrative and its multiple tragic moments with a profound feeling of empathy for the plight of Bathsheba over the series of events of which she had no control much like the helplessness which Rembrandt's own beloved Hendrike must have felt at, at the time as a result of Rembrandt's love. Rembrandt's empathy lays blame for the plight of both of these women, Rembrandt's lover Hendrike and David's Bathsheba, squarely on a society whose norms do not take into account their effects on the many women who are loved by men. I'm going to skip over my discussion of this for purposes of time and conclude. Together with his thoughtful reading of the biblical passages, Rembrandt's life, which had a profound impact on his personal interpretation of events, had bequeathed to us a priceless body of works that affirm the depth of human emotion and experience. 
Now, there are times when I'm asked, given the seemingly number of stresses in our lives, why would one study early modern painting? After all, these works seem to provide an escape from our reality rather than gird us to squarely face it and seek solutions. My reply is that we are not the first to face stress and even tragedy. And close looking at such masterpieces as Rembrandt's Bathsheba with understanding are not only a consolation, but a lesson in the essential human emotion of empathy. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So in the Susanna and the elders, you, yep. you pointed out the one elder that's in the tree, right. the other's not there. But is the other us? Like, could you look? It, it could be. The, the thing about Rembrandt's uh, elusive paintings, uh, we actually know from 17th century descriptions, uh, uh, they're rare, but we do have descriptions of people going to dinner and standing in front of a painting after dinner mm -hmm. and talking about its meaning and mm -hmm. all of the associations that, that it might engender. So it's possible. It's also possible that the guy's back there and the painting, um, as, as you well know, um, over time, there are certain pigments that can darken. And so Rembrandt's paintings are dramatically dark, but a lot of them are probably darker than he had left them at the time. So there may be another one back there. And, and that's what art historians have been trying to, trying to find. Yeah. If, I, if I'm... You know, that, that I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Because that would, of course, uh, an x ray of it would bring up would what's back there. Yeah. yeah. If I may just chime in at the, uh, at the uh, Weissenhofer uh, Theater, they're actually, and I think it's starting in a couple of weeks, they're performing um, the Susanna. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's based on the apocryphal work from, from the, that's not in the Jewish Bible canon, but it's in the apocrypha. And they're, you're performing it here, so you can, if you're a student, I believe you can go see it for free uh, in uh, just a couple of weeks' time. Uh, other questions? Uh, congratulations on your lecture, and we all appreciated the references uh, of Oklahoma. <laughs> so there was a comparison that you were making between uh, one of Rembrandt's works, and was it Picard? Uh, uh, Bernard Picard, Picard. yes, a, the, a French a Huguenot, mm -hmm, any, who actually... Any, any chance we can see that again? Sure, or? yeah. Um, let's see here. Unfortunately, the, you know, it, it, I could enlarge it if I got out of PowerPoint, but... Yeah. Yeah, so I am just struck um, visually by the comparison here. Um, you know, the Rembrandt's piece to me is so much more sophisticated with the use of negative space and, and so on. Are we comparing? Well, one is an etching and the other is an engraving. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it's uh, such an interesting comparison uh, visually. Yeah, well, they, they do have two very different purposes. Because um, Rembrandt was, was you know, depicting the world around him. Uh, that was his life. Bernard Picard uh, wrote a and um, uh, designed the engravings for engraved by other artists. Um, of um, a, Basically, a, it's a, a four volume series of all of the religions and customs of the world. And so it's actually um, thought to be the, or said to be the first anthropological study of religion. So his purpose is not to look at individuals the way Rembrandt was, but to look at ceremony. So. 
Rembrandt's depicting individuals and Picard, Picard is really depicting ceremony where they, all the individuals look the same. I see. The visual comparison, it's really uh, very striking. Thank you. I forget when uh, the Edict of Nantes was revoked, but I'm interested that uh, Bernard Picard is a Huguenot. Uh -huh. And I thought this was about the time Huguenots were getting booted out of France. Yes, they were. So he moved to Amsterdam. Oh, okay. Yeah, he, Very made, good. This, he made this in Amsterdam, which is why it's an apt comparison. Okay. Um, said that she was at Bath. And it looks like she's getting her toenails painted. I wonder why there's no water. So is there something I'm not seeing about tradition about bath? Well, it, it's, like bath. It's, it's not a bath. You're absolutely right. And this is one of the many ways Rembrandt is making allusions to um, you know, to the biblical text. She's actually being groomed for David. Um, but because the, the woman is, is oiling her feet after having washed them. And, um, and so Rembrandt is making allusions to contemporary, you know, certain contemporary practices um, of cleansing a woman after, you know, monthly. And uh, so there, there it's, it's layer after layer of a layer of allusions, both to the biblical text, but a lot of those of the, those elements that are not in the biblical text are allusions to contemporary ideas and practices. Thanks very much for your talk. Um, would it be possible to look at the Rembrandt uh, uh, painting again? Uh, the Bathsheba? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, one thing I think is really interesting is the suggestion that that letter uh, would be the one that's communicating uh, Uriah's death, mm -hmm. which then, you know, especially given the royal uh, chambers there, mm -hmm. uh, changes the context in which the preparation would be happening. Mm -hmm. So rather than uh, Bathsheba being prepared for the original erotic encounter, uh, she's being prepared, you know, potentially for her. Uh, for, for her, her lover, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, there, there's that too. And what, yeah. I, what I've been trying to express is that, is that Rembrandt has, has allowed us to have this kind of conversation in front of the painting with multiple references to, to various aspects of the story. Yeah, no, that's great. I think, it, it, you know, given your own uh, research and presentation on what's going on in Rembrandt's life, giving his own uh, marriage, widowhood, uh, his own uh, mistress, and so forth. That makes it, you know, all the more interesting. So thanks. I don't really have a question. Just thought that was a, an interesting thing uh, yeah. to, that you were discussing. Thanks. Thank you. Actually, if I could just follow up on, on Ranger's point. I don't have a question either, but something that I'm always in awe of with Rembrandt is his sense of the, the biblical context in detail where exactly it is in but also the broad sweep of the narrative. And somehow he manages to have both of those in mind at the same time. Yeah. I can, yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, just to echo the thanks, Ed, mine for a really beautiful and thoughtful um, show. Uh, I have a question. Um, I, I'm really suddenly much more curious about the history of empathy and, you know, particularly empathy, you know, outside of your immediate social circle or family, but empathy across barriers of, um, like, you know, we think of class and gender so much today, but, you know, other, you've, you've alluded to, to some of those in the, in the paintings. Um, more than alluded. I mean, it's so I'm wondering. I the only I'm this is way out of my field, so I'm just we're out of my field too. But go ahead. <laughs> I mean, I, I the reference point for me is this is a big bestseller, but the, the great cultural historian uh, Lynn Hunt wrote about the history of empathy, and mm -hmm. she wanted to date it in a hundred years later. Uh, well, she's an 18th century scholar, <laughs> yeah. And I'm just wondering if, um you know, what you're, it, are there other people engaged in that broader history? Is there a literature you can point us to? 
I'm thinking of the, the, the great line by Umberto Eco about medieval art where he says something to the, I can't remember the exact words, it's much more uh, eloquent in the original, but it's something to the effect, you know, that, that painting for the, the, the pre-Reformation church, obviously, um, allowed the, the sort of complexity and, and refinement and sophistication for the many illiterate people who were coming in and out of the church that, that might have been just a, a or at least the, the literate particle of the population, um, you know, thought that was like theirs alone, that this really sort of spread the, uh, the experience. And I'm wondering if, um, you know, Rembrandt's up to this, is he alone? Is he the first to really push the boundaries of empathy uh, wider than we would expect? As it, Hunt thinks it's, um, it's popular novels, uh, Rousseau's Emile and in England, uh, Richardson's Pamela and the other, you know, bestsellers that right. really, and, and for her, ultimately, this is why we have the democratic revolutions and the, the ideal of universal human rights and all this, you know, wonderful stuff. I'm, is, is there a literature or other people engaged in this and pushing the boundaries of, you know, where we find it? So uh, one, of the, uh, one of my other articles, not on Rembrandt, um, is about how um, paintings actually predate certain texts that, that, that we use as foundational. Uh, pa paintings um, and, and artists may not even have been conscious that they were um, imbuing their paintings with ideas that are beginning to circulate in the culture, but not articulated strongly enough for them to be put, put down in texts. Um, and so I think that's probably what's going on here. Now, with regard to empathy, um, uh, this is going to be short. I'm not going to you know, give, give us an, a whole essay on empathy, but we do need to define what empathy is. Um, and I think our, um, our 21st century uh, psychological sense of empathy is probably very different from, from what it, how empathy was really understood in the 17th century. And you, uh, you make reference to the Middle Ages. Of course, there is a long Catholic practice of um, meditating on the you know, the pain of martyrs and, and Christ's um, passion, uh, which is a form of empathy. And I do think, particularly when Rembrandt inserts himself into these religious paintings, he's picking up on that tradition. So there is a tradition, but there's something about Rembrandt. Um, it, it's in his portraits. You compare his portraits with any other portraits of the 17th century, and there is a sense of the human being back there uh, that is missing from most other portraits, uh, which seem, you know, more like symbols of, of human. Um, and so I've been trying to grapple with where this comes from, because of course, you know, all these other artists were living on the same streets as, as these immigrants um, of varying faiths and, and varying um, parts of the world, and they were not doing this. So, um, you know, for future research. Wow, I, I think I'm just going to take the prerogative with this, with that tremendous answer to just ask the, everyone to thank uh, Dr. Adams and to say there's coffee and water outside. Won't, don't feel no rush to get out. And on behalf of, um, on behalf of the University of Oklahoma, uh, we really thank you for well, thank you so much. I've, I've enjoyed this enormously.